all the sales going on across the internet, what better than to add another temptation than with the Steam Winter Sale? This bad boy is massive, again, upwards to 75% off some of the best games out right now. From former Game of the Years to indie hits, there's really plenty to be had by all. In this video today, we'll be covering my picks of the top 10 best games on Steam's Winter Sale. We'll be doing this in the same format as the Steam Summer Sale video we did a few months back. You can find that linked in the upper right hand corner if you'd like to see some of the games I covered on that list. Just so that I don't repeat myself, any games that were on the Summer Sale and that are on the Winter Sale, I won't be covering. I like to upfront information on my channel, so please take a look at the chapters in the timeline or the description to see the entire list of games I'll be covering and navigate to whichever ones you'd like. Lastly, as a quick note, if you'd like to purchase any of the games on this list, you can find a good portion of them or other games I cover on the channel in my Nexus store, linked in the description. This is a great way to support the channel and they have a direct partnership with developers where you just get a Steam key direct. But sometimes the sale doesn't match up and I want to make sure you guys get the best value, so do what makes the most sense. With that, let's dive in on the list. First up on our list is Crusader Kings 3, a game I've been covering since it came out in September of this year. If you're into grand strategy in the medieval times, then say no more. Crusader Kings 3 is for you. Created by Paradox Interactive, it's the latest in the Crusader Kings series, which puts you at the head of a medieval court in either 867 or 1066 AD. From here, you will manage your kingdom as a count, duke, king, or even emperor. The game is incredibly intricate. I've had instances where I was at war with the Byzantine Emperor, and I was able to draw the war into a protracted engagement, which ended inconclusively because I was able to incite enough unrest with his vassals to create a civil war that I used to supplant the Emperor and gain full autonomy. I've been obsessed with the game lately, and it's truly an incredible experience if you're into medieval history, grand strategy games, or just trying to create your own version of Game of Thrones. Speaking of that, the Steam Workshop gives you access to tons of mods. Some of the more popular ones from Crusader Kings 2 were the Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones mods, which allowed you to play the games as if in those worlds. So with the mods to come and a future DLC, CK3 is a great investment. Fair warning, if you do pick it up, there is a big learning curve, but lucky for you, I have a playlist of tons of guides linked in the upper right corner to help you break into your new life in the Middle Ages. Continuing on with our trend of grand strategy, we take a step into space with Stellaris, also by Paradox Interactive. Don't worry, this is the last one we'll be covering even though their entire catalog is on sale right now. If you managed a court in Crusader Kings 3, in Stellaris, you manage an interstellar species traversing a randomly generated galaxy with randomly generated placement of other species. There is a ton of intricacies to the game, from custom building out the actual mechanics of your species to the physical appearance. Even further, the gameplay allows you to build up individual star systems with various economic, civic, and military buildings. Even further, further, you can get down to the planet level and select buildings on each planet. Do you want a sprawling tech world focused on producing resources for your empire, or do you want an entire star system dedicated to civic advancements? The choice is yours. Solaris is even more of a sandbox than Paradox's other games because you don't know what you'll be encountering with each playthrough. With amazing space warfare and engrossing empire management, you'll be plugging away hours in st into Stellaris without even realizing it. Also. The in-game tutorial is probably one of the strongest in the entire franchise. I, I found I was able to break into the game with relative ease, and that's saying a lot if you've dabbled with Paradox games before. My last big point for Stellaris is that it has an amazing Star Trek mod that acts as a total conversion of the game, essentially turning it into the Star Trek game we need. And I, for one, would love to play as a sentient race with an advanced frontal lobe that looks like a butt with gigantic ear canals, also known as a Ferengi. Sticking with the future but moving to RPGs, our next game on the list is Wasteland 3 by In Exile Entertainment. The latest out from Brian Fargo Studio, this is the continuation of the Wasteland series in a big way. Wasteland 2, which came out in 2014, was an incredible RPG in its own right, continuing the post-apocalyptic narrative started by Wasteland 1 in 1988, but the third game in the series dialed it up. You'll be playing an isometric RPG that utilizes the Unity engine, navigating around the map to enter into amazingly voice acted dialogue and engaging in some of the best combat in the series. If you've played Fallout 1 and 2, Wasteland 3 is regarded as what Fallout 3 should have been. 
It takes the standard turn-based system and sort of meshes it with XCOM, using a grid and cover system to make for a very well streamlined experience. You'll be taking command of two members of Ranger Team November in a post-apocalyptic winter wonderland of Colorado. There, you'll be working alongside the ruler of the land, the Patriarch, to deal with three wayward heirs. It's a game filled with plenty of dilemmas that will sway the story one way or the other, with an RPG system that will have you outfitting each member of your team as well as vehicles that they use. If you're heavy on post-apocalyptic RPGs, this is definitely for you. Our seventh entry on this list is a sleeper hit from last year when we could shake hands without worrying about spreading a plague. Remnant from Ashes is a really quirky and unique game that takes a lot of great beats from the first-person RPG genre that has risen in popularity in the last decade. Developed by Gunfire Games, Remnant is a dark and twisted world where humanity is on the brink of destruction by an interdimensional force of evil known as the Root. You're tasked with essentially finding ways to beat back the Root and discover more about it, and that you do. A lot of the aesthetics of the game would look like they're cracked out of Guillermo del Toro's mind with an awesome synthesis between art and horror, so you won't be left wanting when it comes to unique and elaborate environs with different monsters from location to location. The game mechanics are also very interesting, as they borrow a lot of elements from the Souls series of games. Take armor, for example. The heavier the armor, the slower your character moves, and thus the slower he can jump and roll around. Also, the talent system is discovered throughout the game by beating a boss, finding a book, going to a new area, or using the right combination of items and weapons. Even further, a lot of the encounters in the game are random. The world procedurally generates. So, if you go to play the game with a friend, since it has up to three player co-op, you both won't experience the exact same world with the exact same encounters. With the Diablo-style loot system, a DLC that just dropped earlier this year, and an expansive character system, Remnant is one of my more favorite games to have stumbled upon back when it was free on Epic Games. And at 50% off now, it's a steal for hours upon hours of co-op or even solo gameplay across a bleak and scary landscape. This next entry is going to be a quick one because we all know Halo, or at least what it's about. So there's no need to go into the nitty gritty of this, but the Halo Master Chief Collection is an absolute steal. It's 40% off and it gives you the absolute best games from the series, including Halo 1, Halo 2, Halo 3, Halo 3 ODST, and then the prequel Halo Reach. I think that every human being that grew up playing the Halo games immediately gets goosebumps whenever they hear that familiar overture as they burned countless hours of their youth killing the Covenant and Flood alike. If you've only played the game on console, you owe it to yourself to experience the game in a full 60 frames per second with access upwards to 4K if you're feeling particularly spicy. Quick note on the games it includes, uh, they're the remastered versions of the games, so you have the ability to pop back and forth between the old and the new graphics to see the difference if you want to get an extra kick right uh, old nostalgia berries. Moving away from the big AAA titles, we have Hades, a recent release this year that has absolutely crushed the scene. It definitely deserved Game of the Year, I don't care what you say, that or Ghost of Tsushima, either one. But it was made by Supergiant Games, the same people that made Bastion. You're in for one of the most heavy-hitting, enjoyable, visually pleasing, and adrenaline-pumping roguelike games of the last few years. You play as the son of Hades, Zagreus, as you attempt to make your way out of the underworld to meet up with all of your cousins and uncles, the other gods of Olympus. Moving up each level, you progressively deal with more and harder enemies, with a boss level occurring every bit of the way. After you defeat a boss, you progress to a different portion of the underworld, changing the mechanics of the world as well as the monsters within. The game introduces you to its mechanics so well in the beginning so you have little trouble picking them up, which is good because it gets challenging quite fast. And if you die, you start all the way back at the bottom. But you keep any power-ups, relics, or any kind of special items that you gathered along the way, giving you a chance to upgrade Zagreus further or unlocking new weapons before continuing your climb once more. One thing I love about the game is, of course, the visuals. They're flashy while also being controlled and not over the top. The voice actors are amazing and the artist's take on each of the individual gods is just so fun. As you interact with their special blessings in the world, you are granted a boon that is quote unquote flavored, let's just say, with the theme of the god, which can make for some really juicy and devastating combos. 
Hideous has had me hooked, and the gameplay loop is very satisfying and easy to break into, while also hard to master. In a similar vein to Hades, Blasphemous, developed by The Game Kitchen, is a Metroidvania that takes on a gritty Dark Souls feel to it. If you loved Symphony of the Night, the old Castlevania game, this is definitely going to be a game that you'll be at home with. You play as the Penitent One, in a land blessed or cursed, depending on who you are, by the Miracle. This force twists some people into abominations and lifts others to new heights. Your task is a pilgrimage as the last remaining member of the Brotherhood of the Silent Sorrow. The game is dripping with grisly art and has such an ominous feel to it, uh, to the menacing sound of the narrator, to the distant and ephemeral sounding voice of a floating head coated in gold. The boss battles are gripping and challenging. The narrative is told through mini cutscenes using the game's art style as to not be too immersion breaking, and the mechanics are linear while also being unique. Every time your character dies, he leaves behind a guilt fragment that he has to return to, receiving less money and experience until he does. So it's not over the top complex, but there are ramifications for dying other than just simply restarting at a checkpoint. In addition, there's an upgrade system which allows you to increase the Penitent One's abilities. Blasphemous will feel very similar to anyone who has played Dead Cells, but wants a more standard Metroidvania-style gameplay loop with a very different and gritty storyline that's something more like a Dark Souls game. And just like a Dark Souls game, the very first thing you encounter in the game is a boss, so it's plenty, plenty I like Dark Souls. Going back a bit to strategy, Battle Brothers by Overhype Studios is one of the most brutally punishing strategy games to date, but also one of the most rewarding of the same time. Taking place in a fantasy world, you play as the leader of a band of mercenaries, leading them on to more and more greatness throughout the kingdom as you navigate the politics and allegiances that weave their way through the land. You'll be fighting bands of undead monsters, ghoulish creatures, highwaymen, other mercenary groups, assembled armies, whatever the situation is. One thing to mention, the world is randomly generated and seeded so you can copy and paste someone else's seed into your game if they have a particularly fun map setup that you want to try out or whatever it is. So the setting, while simple, is very vibrant. You navigate from location to location in an overworld map filled with the movement of other NPCs' parties, giving you a sense of being in the middle of a living world, which is unique considering the game represents all characters by a small 2D bust that changes with the equipment you slap on them. When it comes to actual combat, it's done similarly to other games of its ilk. You'll be moving on a massive hex grid, utilizing action points with a permadeath mechanic. But it's not as simple as just slapping things with a weapon. There's a lot of nuance to the game that makes it both challenging and refreshing in its field. For instance, if you're using a shield, you can form a shield wall. And if you're using a spear, you can make a phalanx, basically. This mechanic then goes one further. Sitting next to other characters with shield wall will give more bonuses the same with phalanx. Then inside of that, armor has a real active form of damage mitigation, but you also have to upkeep it in different ways in other RPGs or strategy games because it can outright save a character from a death blow but break in the process. It's just such an elaborate game that is very accessible and goes from a small 7-10 to 10 man skirmish to massive battle with 20 men on each side. Brutal, unforgiving, but intoxicatingly fun, Battle Brothers is a three-year-old game that is still very popular today. Our next game, and second to last one on this list, is unlike any other game mentioned. RimWorld by Ludian Studios is one of the most unique games to date. Put it simply, imagine if The Sims, Terraria, and Minecraft all had a baby. This baby would be really weird and probably talk in the odd Sims language, but it'd also be called RimWorld. The premise of the game is not necessarily to create some big fort in the mountains or delve deep for treasure. Nay, the point of RimWorld is to create a colony for people, but it's really so much more than that. The game simulates psychological connections, creating intrigue and also relationships with each of the colonists. The game opens up with you choosing where to crash land, really the only decision you get to make that isn't randomly generated for you. There, your three survivors of a destroyed passenger liner in orbit begin the first steps on creating what will become the massive colony you will call home. Each character has their own disposition. Say a nobleman, for example, will be great at social skills like recruiting others or haggling with traders, but will refuse to do manual labor. 
This is important because in order to grow your colony, you need to buy colonists from slavers, convert them from pirates who attack you, or recruit them as they wander into your settlement. The world is massive and expansive, and as your colony grows, so do the people within, getting married, having kids, affairs, forming alliances, or rivalries with each other. With the relationships, though, also come technological growth, evolving from simple tools to elaborate machines and holding pens for tamed animals or medical facilities that create prosthetic limbs. You can even venture out, exploring the planet you call home and encountering other tribes, colonies, and cities along the way. The entire world is alive and the NPCs within remember and record every action, dictating their behavior towards the other characters. Maybe one has developed a chronic issue that results in a certain disposition change from another character. It's absolutely insane the depth you can encounter. RimWorld is a game that you can put on a lo-fi mix on YouTube and honestly just lose your life to. And everyone will have an entirely different experience in this game. Remember when I said Sims? Well, it's maybe it's like Sims Midlife Crisis and Prosthetic Limb Edition because the game will get out of control and you're in for a wild ride alongside the game's AI storyteller. All right, here it is, number one on our list and a game that probably wouldn't be as forefront in my mind if Cyberpunk 2077 didn't have as much controversy around it. Ghost Runner. Shockingly enough, this one comes from another Polish developer one more level, and it scratches that cyberpunk genre itch in a real big and very difficult way. The easiest game to compare this to is if Dishonored was set in cyberpunk rather than steampunk setting. You play as Jack, a ghost runner. These super soldiers essentially act as the police in Dharma Tower, a massive skyscraper where all that's left of humanity resides. As your character comes to at the beginning of the game, his entire memory is wiped and has to discover what happened to him as well as restore some of his circuitry to grant him new abilities. Guiding Jack along the way is the Architect. This is a disembodied super AI that directs Jack towards that the means of repairing the Architect's broken cyber void system. Restoring each one further empowers the AI, who you discover is the consciousness of Adam, the individual who created Dharma Tower, and the Ghost Runners. That's not a spoiler, you find out in the first like two seconds. Word to the wise though, this game is absolutely brutal. It's beautiful in its environment, and the seamless movement through the platformer-like first-person puzzles is also seamless and enjoyable. It makes you feel like an unstoppable badass. That is, until you encounter enemies. In Ghost Runner, everything in the game world is a one hit, one hit, one kill, including you. So you will slice your way through a horde of bad guys, slowing down time using your special sensory boost while parkouring your way to victory, or you'll get punched and killed immediately. It's one of those games where you'll play an area over and over and over, and each time it's a high octane slugfest, much in the same way that Doom Eternal is on higher difficulties. So, if you decide to pick up Ghost Runner on my Nexus store, please keep in mind that you are in for a lot of groans and anger as you die, but also some of the most satisfying and gorgeous victories when you manage to finally cut your way through an area. With that, it brings our list to an end. Hopefully you found some games in this list that were off the beaten path. Uh, I wanted to highlight some really awesome, more mainstream quote-unquote games, but also go into a bit of the sleepers of not just 2020, but over the years. So, whether you're dealing with the grueling game world of Battle Brothers or trying not to cuss me out under your breath for recommending Ghost Runner to you, I think that you'll find something to really plug your life into across the next few weeks or months. Or, if you're particularly sadistic, just gift the hard game to a friend who is notorious for breaking controllers. I hope you enjoyed this video here today, guys. Please use the link in my description if you'd like to support the channel by purchasing any games of the mentioned games through here, uh, if they're available, that is. Also, don't forget to do all the subscribing and commenting action, but have a good one, stay safe this holiday, and take care.